Okay, so let me relay some of our results. I'm sure they're some of yours. So we noted that if we use the same type of candle, the candle in the larger beaker burns for a longer time than the candle in the smaller beaker. And two, we observed some strange behavior in, in part two. And when the beaker is initially placed over the candle, nothing seems to happen. The flame just kind of goes as we would expect. Uh, but when the candle goes out, at the moment it extinguished, the water level suddenly rises up inside the beaker as if it's been sucked up into it. Mind you, this is against the force of the water's rising up, against the force of gravity, pushing down the water. So our biggest conclusion we can take away is that the air around the burning substance is clearly changing in some way. You know, initially, the air inside the beaker can support a flame, then it can't support a flame. So there's a difference in the properties of the air, which mind you, which I'll remind you is kind of a radical thing to say. Remember the Greek four element theory suggested that air is an unchangeable element. So let's leave the deeper analysis to our pioneers of chemical theory, Johann Betcher, Ernst Stahl, and our young Robert. Um, so again, let me take you back to the 1670s. It's December 13th, 1676. Ernst Stahl and Robert are sitting around the cleaned up lab table the day following the experiment. They're waiting for Master Betcher now, Robert, if you're ready, we'll try and explain our results using our very own chemical theory of phlogiston. Ernst gives the young scientist a nudge of support just as Betcher approaches the table. Robert, Betcher cuts straight into it. Please summarize your results. And Robert takes a deep breath, looks over his notes, and begins. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we burned candles in different sized glasses and found large beakers with more air in them allow a flame to burn for a longer time. After a candle burns, the air in the inverted beaker seems to pull in water from beneath it. Very good. Now, Ernst, kindly remind us of our current understanding of the principle, understanding on the principles of phlogiston theory. Of course, sir. Burnable substances are chemicals that are composed of phlogiston, bonded to other substances like ash. Burning ash releases the phlogiston, and this process produces the fire that we see. Betcher closes his eyes for a moment, pulls out a dirty sponge. Ernest and Robert look at each other, confused. If phlogiston is released from burning substances, Betcher says, perhaps it is, it is itself a special invisible air, and this phlogiston air fills the ordinary air around, around it like a water into a sponge. And there's a point where the air is full, it's saturated with phlogiston, and it can no longer hold anymore. And this phlogiston can no longer exit the material from where it's burning. The reaction stops. This explanation fits our results from part one and seems to agree with our observations that smoke from burning objects is lifted up into the air in a room with a fire, and it fills with fumes. Ernst is quick to add, of course, we would predict that a larger beaker is like a larger sponge, so both candles burn at the same rate producing the same amount of phlogiston, the candle in the smaller beaker will fill its smaller air sponge in a shorter time and go out quicker. The air all around us then is just one enormous sponge willing to accept all the phlogiston we throw at it. Robert pauses, uncertain if he's allowed to comment. But wait, how do we explain our results from part two? You know, he's kind of saying this sheepishly around these two masters of science. The air seems to disappear. So where is the phlogiston going? So phlogiston is going up into the sponge. How can it disappear? Betcher and Stahl exchange bewildered glances. Ah, I'm sure there's a good explanation. Betcher cuts in. Betcher and later chemists of the 1700s actually shrugged this observation off. Maybe phlogiston is filling in empty spaces in the air, the way water fills gaps in a sponge, and the water rising is just a curiosity that can be ignored. The brightest minds of the time ignored this observation. Maybe we can too. Do you think we can ignore this observation? Just not worry about the water rising up. What do you think?